One of the greatest political comeback victories in all of U.S. history is in 1968 when Richard Nixon won the office of the presidency. He, the last time that we saw Nixon running for president was in 1960, and that was that famous media election when he lost to JFK in the televised debates. But it's an interesting election because the Democrats were in disarray after that convention in Chicago, Major, Mayor Richard Daley and the riots and the police and the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy appeared to be the front runner for the nominee for the Democrats in that election just seemed disorganized and, and just out of out of touch with uh, the United States um, with the way the Vietnam War had gone. So Hubert Humphrey lost more than 100 electoral votes, but the popular vote was a slimmer margin. People began to look to Richard Nixon, a more conservative president, to go and change the direction of the Vietnam War. And that's what I want you to think about as we go through this. Nixon, is he is he just continuing what Lyndon Johnson would do, as in saying one thing and doing another? Or did he really come through with his promises like he did in the 1968 election in saying that, well, I'm going to be your candidate. Vote for me because I will go and get us out of the war. Nixon had a lot of help. For example, um, uh, much of his foreign policy was under the direction of a man named Hugh Henry Kissinger. Um, both men ha are trying to develop a plan to go and get the United States out of the Vietnam War. The idea was twofold. You have the linkage policy and trying to go in and smooth things out between us and the Soviets, us and the Chinese, and hopefully actually play them against the, the North Vietnamese and potentially rolling back support and aid to them in the war. Peace talks as well. The hope is we'll go in. It can also, it's also known as triangle diplomacy, peace in Vietnam, peace with China, peace with the Soviet Union. You also have the policy of Vietnamization, as in Nixon promised that we'd have the gradual withdrawal of American troops in Vietnam and then handing that the rest of the fighting over to the South Vietnamese. Now, so these are secretly going on behind closed doors. You have these, these talks about peace, but you're about to see Nixon in a lot of ways expands the war in Vietnam. He'll expand it with increased airstrikes, in Hanoi, Christmas bombings, you'll see in a second, and then actually expanding the war over into neighboring countries like Cambodia. Um, in 1969, Americans found out about an incident that happened in 1968. And so months prior, there had been a massacre of civilians in South Vietnam at a little hamlet called My Lai. Lieutenant William uh, Cawley and his men or, um, went in and massacred about 200 South Vietnamese civilians, and uh, more or less it was covered up. It wasn't, there was not much said about it, but then the story broke to the public, and it just fueled the fires for more protests, and people were pushing harder and harder for the United States to get out of the Vietnam War as well. And so, again, people were questioning, are we really on the, on the right side of the war? So in April 1970, Nixon announced that American troops would go on and invade, expand the war over into Cambodia to destroy Viet Cong military bases. So again, you have a second wave of protests, more one, more protests uh, to try and get us out of the Vietnam War as well. The most infamous of the protests that you should be aware of happened at Kent State in Ohio. Kent State students were protesting the expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia, and things did get a little out of hand. You can see that they actually burned down one of the buildings. So the National Guard was brought in. You can see the clash between the National Guard and protesters. Um, unfortunately, the National Guard did open fire on the students of Kent State. Four of them will be killed. That photo in particular is one of the most famous ones, or infamous, um, of the Vietnam War. Um, uh, of students that were that were hurt and, and, and some that were killed in the protests. There were also students that were hurt and, and killed at Jackson State in Louisiana as well. So protests were all around the country trying to, to pressure President Nixon to withdraw from Vietnam and continue doing that. So in 1970, Congress repealed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Later on, you're going to see the War Powers Act. You're going to see measures taken to get away from too much power being in the hands of the president. So remember, the Gulf of Tonka Resolution gave Congress the power to declare war to Lyndon Johnson. Now, that's been repealed and taken away. But things look even worse for um, the, the, our national government with a leak 
of the story of the Pentagon Papers. So the 1971 former Defense Department worker named Daniel Ellsberg leaked to the Pentagon Papers. What did they say? They were more or less documents that are saying how um, the government um, would get on camera and that publicly they would support the war, but privately they had major concerns and major questions. Um, and it proved there was a credibility gap when the, the papers hit, when the story hit the newspapers as well. So Americans felt deceived, they felt distracted, they felt betrayed by their own government by, by reading stories like the Pentagon Papers. So by 71, two thirds of Americans want the war to be finished and over with. So Nixon in going into re-election by 1972 is promising that there will be peace at hand. And he's promising that, okay, I promise you by the end of my second term, we're gonna be done with Vietnam, it's gonna be over with. And so in 72, Nixon will win in the landslide again based on that candidate, based on that promise of I'm your candidate who will get us out of war. I can tell you, though, even after he's reelected, you still have the Christmas bombings of Hanoi. One last ditch effort to bomb the North Vietnamese into surrender. And, and, and potentially, if they do not surrender, at least get them to the peace table. So what was the sticking point? The North Vietnamese were particularly wanting to go and have their soldiers remain in South Vietnam. The South Vietnamese would not have anything um, like that. And you can kind of understand their position with that. So there was, there, was, there was kind of a gridlock between the North and the South Vietnamese. But in 1973, the Paris Peace Accords will be signed. Vietnam at the time was divided at the 17th parallel, still communist North and a pro-Western South Vietnam as well. So 1973, the war is over. At the time, it was the longest American war. Now it's the war on terror. But the United States has withdrawn from Vietnam, and that's, that ends our direct involvement that's at like the time. But I can tell you that even um, as Vietnam had reunited for a while, um, a couple years later, in 1975, the North Vietnamese will go on to invade the South. Um, the South Vietnamese do ask for U.S. assistance, but um, Richard Nixon at the time had resigned. Our own government was kind of in disarray, and Gerald Ford remembered how unpopular the Vietnam War was and decided, nope, this is not the time for us to get involved one more time and, and, and again. And so on April 30th, 1975, Saigon was captured. It was renamed Ho Chi Minh City. Um, you can see that there's actually a lot of um, neighboring countries like Cambodia that will also fall to communism. Um, there is a little truth to the domino effect. Um, Cambodia falls to communism. A leader of a group called the Khmer Rouge named Pol Pot will rise to power. Um, you have between one and two million people that will either starve to death or they're either executed. Um, very brutal ruler. It ends in 1979, it's in 1979 but I would rank him up there with Hitler. And, and Joseph Stalin is one of the worst dictators we've ever had in all of world history. So the war was expensive, $170 billion, 50,000 deaths. And um, it really spotlighted a lot of problems with, with soldiers, especially the idea of PTSD with all the combat that they did. Good see. evening. One of the final things I want you to see, though, before we finish up, is in 1973, Congress did pass the War Powers Act to put limits on the executive power. It requires a president to inform Congress of any commitment of troops abroad within 48 hours and to withdraw them in 60 to 90 days unless Congress approved the troop commitment. So now Congress has more power in as far as deciding and declaring war on any other countries. I hope that was helpful. Please let me know if you have any more questions. Thanks for listening.